Well, a warm welcome to Blackburn Presbyterian Church and thank you for joining us. Since February the 2nd, we've been reflecting on Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Back then, we had no idea about the impact of COVID-19 and how it would affect our services. So this is our ninth Sunday of live streaming what are elements of our usual service. I think we've made changes to some aspects of our streaming every one of those nine weeks. You can find a PDF of our regular Sunday leaflet uh, on the church webpage, blackburnpc.org.au. It's uh, just a simple leaflet, contains references to the country we pray for each week and to people we remember in prayer. And it also contains an outline of the service, uh, the sermon which we'll be hearing this morning. Uh, you can also find this uh, services in a YouTube format on the web page, if that suits you. The absence of singing is something that we've not yet overcome. Uh, I'm most grateful to the Reverend Dr. Alan DeMond of uh, New Hope Baptist Church for offering to let us use their music should we want to. Thank you for that, Alan. It's very much appreciated. However, this morning we've been able to add some live music, which you'll hear shortly. This past Tuesday was International Nurses Day and the 200th anniversary of the birth of the mother of all nurses. More about her later, because there's never been a better time to remember nursing. Please leave a comment to let us know that you visited and do let us have any thoughts, questions or reflections in the comments option. Today I invite you to join in the worship of God. We will pray, we will listen to the Holy Scriptures, we'll reflect on them and we'll be still as we hear music that draws together many of the ideas that run through our minds. As we hear from our government about a map out of lockdown, may we hear Jesus speaking to us about our choice of the way forward. Let us begin then with prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you that the wonder of the internet means that we can connect with each other across the miles from our homes and with each other in a way that's real but very different. We ask that you will connect with us too. Help us to know you're present. Help us to know that you have a plan and a purpose for us because you love your creation and you want us to love in return. We ask your blessing on this uh, service and this opportunity to worship. Connect with each one of us by your spirit and we will give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to hear uh, a little piece of Bach played by one of our members here, Amanda. I'd like to come forward, Amanda. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you, Amanda. Let us pray. Lord, we draw near as we hear the music. Our minds are filled with the beauty of it, the wonder of its implications, the minds that shaped it. And we know that from your mind all things have come. By your word you have created us and the entire universe. And this morning as we seek to hear the voice of Jesus, we ask that you will enable us each to hear clearly, to see him and to love him dearly and follow him more nearly. We ask it for his namesake. Amen. Christine is going to lead us in our reflection on Young at Heart. Thank you, Christine. Excuse me, because I'm also sucking a throat lozenge to stop me coughing. Well, this is 2020, the month of May, and on May the 12th, 1820, a baby girl was born in Florence, in Italy, and her parents named her Florence. Since 1965, May the 12th has been chosen to be the International Nurses Day in honour of Florence, Florence Nightingale. How did this happen? happen? Well, at school I learned about Florence Nightingale's work as a nurse in the, Korean war, in the Crimean War. So she was in her 30s then, in the 1850s. She was called the Lady with the Lamp and we pictured her and probably saw pictures of her going around among the sort of camp beds or pallets on which wounded soldiers lay, if they were fortunate enough to have anything but the floor to lie on. She was always holding a lamp and we imagined her comforting them as best she could. That is actually only a very small part of what Florence did. Florence was a Christian and believed that God had work, to do for her, work for her to do in nursing. And so she turned down two marriage proposals. In the 19th century, so the 1800s, it was very rare for a woman to combine family life and a career. After the Crimean War, Florence set up a nursing school at St. Thomas's Hospital in London and is often credited with establishing the basis for nursing as a profession. You will find so much more about Florence Nightingale on the internet, but today I just want to say a few things about why we can learn so much from her during the COVID-19 pandemic. And some of what I'm quoting is from Julia Beard's article yesterday, in the age. In her 1860 book called Notes on Nursing, Florence wrote, every nurse ought to be careful to wash her hands very frequently during the day. If her face too, so much the better. It's not just nurses who are being told to do this today. When Florence first arrived at the military hospital in the Crimea, she found wounded men lying unbandaged on unwashed floors. She was appalled and introduced hygiene and ensured that infected patients were kept apart from one another. So isolation, I guess. She find, financed a lot of the original PPE, personal protection equipment herself, and also through newspaper appeals. Some of you will have noticed that the emergency hospital built in London to cater for an overflow of COVID-19 patients was called the Nightingale Hospital. In September last year, the London Institute of Hygiene and Topical Medicine celebrated its 120th anniversary. 
So I think that means it was founded in 1899, while Florence was well and truly alive doing her pioneering work. But in 2019, the names of Florence Nightingale and two other significant medical women were added to the Institute's famous frieze of 23 male medicos. It only took them 120 years to notice these women. So I'm quoting from the director of that London Institute. Florence Nightingale was one of the most prominent statisticians in history and her groundbreaking work in data visualization continues to be influential today. Florence also produced over 200 publications on hospital planning and organization. So hygiene, isolation, record keeping, act actions based on evidence, all these ring bells with us today. However, Florence also established one other important factor in medicine, which strikes a chord with all of us who've been enjoying our gardens and our daily walks in green spaces. Again, I'm quoting from her book, Notes on Nursing, Florence speaking. I have seen in fevers the most acute suffering from the patient not being able to see out of the window. I shall never forget the rapture of fever patients over a bunch of bright coloured flowers. I remember in my own case, when I was a fever patient, a nosegay of wild flowers was sent to me. And from that moment, recovery became more rapid. People say the effect is only on the mind. It is no such thing. The effect is on the body too. Little as we know about the way in which we are affected by form, by colour and light, we do know this. They have an actual physical effect. So let us be grateful for the work of Florence Nightingale and also for all her successors, our nurses of today, and may our gratitude to our nurses continue long after the end of this pandemic. Thank you, Christine. And thank you, Florence Nightingale and all who follow in her footsteps. May God bless the work you do. Now, our Bible reading uh, is to be read by Sonia. Sonia is a good friend of Amanda who was playing before. And Sonia sent a clip to us from Bacchus Marsh uh, via her husband, Ian. Um, I'm, this is an experiment, really. Uh, I hope you'll listen in carefully and hear the, the text that's being read. It's from John chapter 10 about Jesus, the good shepherd, and being the gate for the sheep. Um, the audio isn't as, uh, as loud as you're hearing through this microphone, but I hope you'll make it out all right. So here's our Bible reading from John 10, read by Sonia. Thank you. 
Thank you, Sonia. It's lovely to have you here with us, just uh, ever so briefly like that. And uh, the birds in Bacchus Marsh, I wasn't sure I was hearing them through the windows here or uh, straight through from you. So we're, we're hoping you're having a lovely day there today. So we come to our 15th study on the Sermon on the Mount. We're getting close to the end. And uh, it's come, uh, our reflection has come at a time when we've been very conscious of a new virus around the world. Governments have imposed restrictions to slow and manage the spread of COVID-19. Eventually, as the situation came under control, a mood of impatience with the need for personal distancing uh, ended or surged. We didn't want to keep that going. And this mood was rising in Australia. And differences across the states uh, enabled media reports uh, to fan the frustration. And this week... Restrictions began to be loosened in all Australian states. We're all wondering what the new normal might mean now. There's even going to be a TV program on the ABC called New Normal. What lessons will have shaped what our politicians are calling the roadmap out? Well, we understand the metaphor. Our political leaders are not actually giving us a map of any roads at all. The roadmap is a way of living to help us escape the virus while getting on with what we hope will be, what we imagine will be the rest of our lives. Now, In the closing section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus also presents his listeners with a road map to their future. So powerful was Jesus' metaphor that early Christian believers were more often described as followers of the way than by the term Christian. Let's note three paired images that make up Jesus' metaphor. We have them in the verses 13 and 14 of chapter 7 of Matthew's Gospel. Jesus says, Go in through the narrow gate, because the gate to hell is wide and the road that leads to it is easy, and there are many who travel it. But the gate to life is narrow, and the way that leads to it is hard. And there are a few people that find it. Very sobering note that Jesus brings in at this point. So we're looking now beyond COVID. We're looking at the road map out to the future. And here is Jesus talking about a narrow gate. And if you were able to hear Sonia's reading uh, clearly, it was about the shepherd and the sheepfold. And Jesus saying, I am the gate. So here's an image of a sheepfold and a narrow gate. Of course, in the ancient Middle East, the shepherd himself lay in the entrance and and was the gate. So Jesus is saying, I am the gate. So let's go beyond COVID. Let's look at Jesus' roadmap to the future. And there are three things, three paired things that we want to uh, pick up that make up this metaphor that Jesus is presenting us with. Firstly, He talks about two ways, and then he talks about two outcomes, and then he talks about two gates. So let's pick up these things. Firstly, two ways. How are the roots described? Well, thinking through the Sermon on the Mount, we've been listening to all that Jesus has said, and we've felt his intensely personal call. His Beatitudes draw on the devotion and piety of the humble poor of Israel. The blessings of God are for the poor in spirit, for those who mourn, for the meek, for those who hunger for what is right, for the merciful, for the pure in heart, and for the peacemakers. We had a go at learning those, that sequence, and how have we done? Perhaps we've forgotten it all with COVID. Well, You remember as you think through the Sermon on the Mount and the way things were before COVID, the appeal of the crowd. The crowds want to be back, don't they? Crowded platforms, parties, pubs and clubs, even the stadiums where we cheered and sang with the crowds. Memories of being there, listening to you too. My first big stadium meeting was with in Australia was with Billy Graham at the Melbourne Cricket Ground in 1959. Uh, well over 100 and 
30,000 people. The reports range from 130 to 140,000. Uh, my second meeting there was the Olympic Games, what it is to be part of a great crowd. And I've been there for all kinds of other things, but not as much football as I should um, for some reason. So in the crowd, we feel connected. But how real is it? Sometimes we wonder. Jesus declared as blessed a people to whom we're drawn. And as we listen to his sermon, his words began to seem more real about anger, real about unfaithfulness, real about marriage. He talked about going the extra mile and even about loving enemies. To him, these things mattered. And when we heard him talk about religious devotion, he declared hypocrisy and pretense as uh, uh, terrible. He, he cut right across it and he rated forgiveness highly. He said we sh that the love of money was a problem and he advised against the arrogance of condemning others, being censorious. And his words, 2,000 years later, still have what J.B. Phillips called the ring of truth. The boundaries of Jesus' vision create a path. And there are boundaries to that path. It's narrower than the jollity of the hail fellow, well met, no worries because she'll be right, mate, which trends in the crowded way with which we have inklings of familiarity and sense the appeal. But by contrast, Jesus' way seems narrow, but more defined and secure. Maybe, like me, you feel glad that there is a way opening up in contrast to the wide way. But let's think, too, secondly, about two outcomes. His two ways metaphor comes from the facets of Israel's literature. Not just from a text or two, but from the whole of it. From the Torah, the first five books. From the prophets, who call people to back to the faithfulness of the Torah, to the way of life. And from the writings, the wisdom literature of Israel. The book of Psalms, for example, gives pride of place to the image of two ways, the way of righteousness and the way of uh, wickedness. And the, it describes the, the righteous way as being a life like a, a tree planted by a river, bearing fruits and uh, beautiful to behold. And, and, it, and it contrasts this with a, with a life which is just the opposite of a flourishing tree, really, a sh sort of shredded life, just chaff, blown around by the wind. Now the outcome we seek is the beauty and the fruitfulness of a tree, a tree of life, another of the images the Bible gives us, depicted in righteous living and living in a kind of relationship with God. The psalm, first psalm, which uh, many commentators believe Jesus was drawing on, uh, talks about the winnowing process and how the chaff is blown away. Indeed, the grain and the wheat, the chaff were thrown into the air when there was a breeze going through the winnowing floor and the breeze blew away the chaff, but the heavier grain was kept and caught. The chaff was dispersed. It's as if it never was. One outcome of the broad and easy way described by Jesus is called destruction. And the word comes from a root word meaning to waste. Have you ever heard of anybody getting wasted? You can't work in a boys' school and not hear that expression somewhere along the road. If you ever saw, have you ever felt you saw a life rich in possibilities being wasted? Well, Jesus contrasts that with a narrow way, which he calls the way to life. The word is zoe, the word which we get zoology from, the whole of animate life. Uh, and it's a word used throughout the New Testament to signify what we heard in uh, Sonia's reading as fullness of life. I've come that they might have life in all its fullness. It's the life of the age to come, the life when God, in a sense, as envisages drawing near to humanity and being among us. And we have a foretaste of that in the presence of Jesus. Why would you settle for less? So we have two ways and two ends, as it were, two outcomes. But we also have two gates. 
Regardless, the crowd travels on together through the wide gate. It's always been popular. The connections to everyone else feel strong and provide a reassuring bon vivant. Like me, you may have felt the drawing power of the crowd. Like me, you may have wondered, how real are the connections? I wonder if you've ever felt alone in the crowd. In the ancient world, the shepherd slept at the entrance of the sheepfold, and with this in mind, we noticed in Sonia's reading that Jesus said, I am the gate for the sheep. I have come that they might find life in all its fullness. Jesus' followers are invited to enter where he himself has been. It is he who guides and guards the entrance. He is the gate. Small and unworthy as we may feel, Jesus calls even me to enter by his narrow gate, his turnstile. So two outcomes, two gates. Here's the turnstile. It's a bit like the one at the Melbourne Zoo. Uh, kids love to try and uh, stand on it and be pushed around, but you can't go right the way around. Once you're on this turnstile, you're on the way out of the zoo. So this is, in a sense, what Jesus is saying to us, that we, we enter one at a time. Paradoxically, his narrow way opens to fullness of life. In reflecting on this, renowned Harley Street specialist turned London preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, observes, you cannot take the crowd with you into the Christian life. It inevitably involves a break. We can put this best, perhaps, by emphasising that it is something that is always intensely personal. Nothing, after all, he says, is more difficult in this life than to realise that we are individual persons. Now, when I read that, it's, it struck me as so true. We are individuals. And God deals with us as individuals. We crave connections. And those connections flow from God to us and from all who love us toward us and embrace us. And it, we're challenged, as Jesus has said, to reach out lovingly to others, to even our enemies. This is what God's, map, God's road map is. To recognize that we are individuals and we are loved. And then to make those connections as we journey Godward. The road map forward begins with the next step. Nobody can take this step for you. You ask, will I come to Jesus? Will I step through his narrow gate? Let none of us hold back. Amen. Now we come to our time of prayer. I'm going to lead you in some prayers and... Uh, invite you to join me with the Lord's Prayer at the close. Let us pray. Almighty God, from the lips of your Son, the Lord Jesus, we have heard the invitation to all and to each of us to enter into the way of life through him. Perhaps we've known your way for a long time, but have been distracted by vanity fair, bypath matter, or the slough of despond as John Bunyan describes them. As we seek to follow your roadmap forward, please forgive our waywardness. Guide our feet in the path of peace. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bring deep cleansing, the deep cleansing of your forgiveness to our longing hearts. Thank you today that there is a way forward from the isolation that enables safety for the vulnerable and healthy work and family balance in our daily lives. Thank you today for Florence Nightingale and her profound commitment to your call on her life and for the way in which those benefits apply at the level of personal care of individuals as well as in public health. Thank you today for the work of nurses and all other medical professionals who have been at risk of COVID-19 themselves as they serve the needs of others. Comfort the sick, 
and draw near to all who mourn the loss of loved ones. We pray that on the roadmap from isolation, we will see cooperation and compliance with those directions that promote the health and safety of the many in the, commu- in the schools and workplaces of the nation. We pray that all of us will remember and carry forward the things we have learned in solitude and the benefits which enrich our families with harmonious, creative, enjoyable and productive routines. We ask that you'll speak calm and reassurance to families feeling frustration, sadness and anger because of the reduced circumstances and encourage those who are working from home remains complicated by homeschooling and by the fear that normal will be very different from before. We pray again that under-resourced poorer nations will be treated generously in terms of equipment and skilled personnel, conscious that uh, South America and Africa, the virus is raging. We also pray that they too will benefit from the international research and development focused on vaccine and treatment. Grant courage and wisdom for those who must always worship in isolation for fear of persecution. Today we think especially of the Chinese churches under pressure to sinicize and conform to party ideology. But we also pray for believers in Saudi Arabia where death is a real consequence of faith in Jesus. Remind us, Lord, once again, to love one another as you have loved us. May we discover each other as we journey in the way of Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers and unite us as we say together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Just before we close with the benediction, I'm going to ask Amanda to play again. This time, Adagio. Thank you, Amanda. How very beautiful. Let us pray. Lord, let your grace, your mercy, and your peace lead and guide us into our future as we follow the Lord Jesus. So guide us into this week, one step at a time, as your children, for his name's sake. Amen.
God bless you.